afternoon and welcome to Wednesdays in the Wild Midweek Wednesday Worship Service, the Pentecost edition here at Community Good Neighbors Buffalo. On behalf of myself, Pastor Charmaine, our music director behind me, Billy Brandau, we welcome you into this space. We are glad that you're able to join us here virtually. There may not be anybody in the building but Billy and I, but this is still the sacred space, and we know from lessons from the pandemic that no matter where we are, whether it's in person or virtual like this, there's still community. We hope that you are enjoying the really nice weather outside. Thankfully, it's not flooding here. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't have any more wildfires going on, so we can all just breathe. Um, <laughs> that's the important thing. We hope you're enjoying the summer. We're kind of at the halfway point. I think of summer and all the summer activities. Uh, one of my young adults said to me yesterday, Mom, I've got 50 days until school starts. <laughs> so, and he's kind of proud of it. Um, <laughs> so we are at that halfway mark point. Um, if you are seeing this streaming on your Facebook page or on your Facebook feed, Community of Good Neighbors is a faith-based community located in the heart of downtown Buffalo. We are dedicated for social, political, and economic change and justice. And therefore, we pour everything that who we are into our fresh collard greens and other healthy things, mobile food pantry, which happens the first and third Thursdays at 10 a.m. at Jericho Road Community Health Center, 21 Doe Street. Also, the second Saturdays, which is upcoming this weekend, again at Jericho Road Community Health Center at 10 a.m. Um, thanks to our partners at Jericho Road for inviting us into the space. We also will be doing a Sunday Mobile Food Pantry at Pilgrim St. Luke on Richmond Avenue, uh, Richmond and Utica, uh, Pilgrim St. Luke UCC at 1130, shortly after their services, which is amazing. The third, third Sundays of every month until it gets probably gets really cold. Um, and we also, starting this fall, will be doing Dinner Church. Dinner Church is where folks come together around the table, it's not just what it is, come together around the table, there's a short little program, and there's this open conversation. So we're emulating what Jesus did with his companions, his followers, sitting around the table, sharing food, sharing conversation, sharing prayer. That will start in some time in September, so stay tuned. This is in cooperation and collaboration with our partners, Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, right next door. So six o'clock on Wednesday, twice a month, Starting out with, come out if you miss church on Sundays or even if you miss worship on Saturdays. Come out and dine with us um, and be a part of the conversation. So I'm excited about that. But more information will be upcoming. Also, um, on the first and third Thursdays throughout the summer into the fall, yes. Big, big table. We are back at Big, big table at 272 Hudson Street. Um, on the lower west side of Buffalo, um, we will be doing our mobile food pantry there from 12 to 1 o'clock. Um, and some more partnerships are coming with Big Big Table. In fact, I have a meeting with their executive director, Heather Swamp, so I'm really excited. Um, it's all these wonderful good things, and yes, this is all this planning. Summer is not about rest. I mean, there's no rest for pantry. Um, <laughs> we just don't. Especially for a small, very small, tiny organization such as CGN. Um, but this is the work that I want to do, and I'm excited to be able to do this each and every day. And yes, I do practice self-care. It's a long time coming, but yes, I do practice self-care. You heard it here first. <laughs> um, just a reminder, um, Saturday, Saturday Night Live at 5 with myself, Pastor Kwame, just a time of reflection. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to actually be between today's service and Saturday service. We're going to be exploring some questions that were posed by author and retired pastor Reverend Kenneth Wheeler of US, the, U the Red Direction of US of American Care. We're going to be discussing that in our worship service today during our homily time. So, wherever you are, whether you're at work, whether you're watching this later, whether you're at home watching this now, I invite you to bring yourself in a place that we can begin our worship time in. O oh, spirit of the first song, the origins of a lullaby, we come here today with our burdens in tow. Would you grant us a comfort, O oh, gentle deep? Our pain has no place to land, no cradle for our souls to rock in. And say to us, yes, let it out. 
I've got you now. There, there, dear child. There, there. There, there, to the rhythm of a heartbeat like a grandmother consoling her son. There, there. There, there, like the psalmist singing in satisfaction, it's all right, child. We made it home. There, there. There, there, shout the activists out in the streets. That's enough now, never again. There, there. For you are here, right here, ever with us, burden bearer, light maker, right here. And it is from this ancient trauma that we worship you. It is from this wreck that we know you. It is from such a place that we pray you right here again. Let us pray. O God of heaven and earth, who is glorified in the wisdom of children, the experts of peasants and wonders, may we evoke your humble heart within us. May we wonder what it might mean to feel our exhaustion and your love, and at the same time, at all at the same exact time. May we consider all you have tried to show, give, or say to us that we weren't ready for. Prepare our souls to yoke with yours, to share in the good news that revives every living thing. We ask this in your name and energy. Amen. from the Psalms, and this poetic interpretation comes from our friends in the UCC. 
How early we learn to separate ourselves when we try to excel from these bodies that we're taught to hate. Persuaded that they trap and betray and trick us into turning down the light to shine within. How unlike the flowers of the valley we are, their sturdy stems bending innocently, unaware of how their beauty moves us. How unlike the ocean tides and their regular ferocity of the crustaceans that scuttle before those waves. If a hermit crab finds its tail too big to be of use, it waits for others to gather, so that they may shift their home. A community comes in together. While we, meanwhile, can hardly stand to feel our own skin in the sun, limbs exposed without judging ourselves rashly. We feel always the eyes of others upon us, so we retreat into our heads with the monsters who lurk there. We wear, rarely break ourselves in do, as the cobwebs do at dawn. We slip our feet into shoes too tight, comb back the hair until it pulls at the scalp punish ourselves for being tossed out of our bodies, our precious, perfect vessels that walk to us, prayer spilling from our lips like pearls. How aware we are of our nakedness, of the vulnerability that comes from the presenting to the world, not the thoughts that stir us to slumber, but these fleshy forms we've injected. How like whole lumps of clay we are, stiff and crackling from disuse. We must fill that living water until the streets run gray and brown and red until we plume ourselves, our leaves as edges jagged as we see fit. Pour us back into these bodies. This is what we have been given. We have hands to speak and soothe and eyes to weep. And if we are lucky, mouths to laugh and rave. And a heart to beat. Amen. Amen. So, I pose the question, if you have been tuning in not only to this, but also our Saturday night sort of devotional time, you may have already heard the question. And as I have said before, and this is kind of a disclaimer, as clergy as pastors, no pastor's worth their weight in anything unless they address what's going on in the world outside. Yes, churches, faith communities are sacred places of people to come to and for comfort and be reminded that the Creator does indeed walk with us, loves us, considers herself, considers us the Creator's children, and that we have a responsibility to care for one another. Not just the ones in the pews, but the ones outside the walls. And not the ones who are just downtrodden, downtrodden, because we're not supposed to go in the door fed. We're actually supposed to engage. And so sometimes the word can be challenging. And it's gotten to a point where the word becomes so challenging. And really, as many faith communities, especially those who identify as being Christian in this particular context, start to actually live this out. There's always a lot of backlash. For example, one of our, so if you know anything about the ELCA, the Lutheran Church, you know we have 65 regions or synods, and so therefore we have 65 bishops or regional managers. So that I like to put things in layman terms so people are like, oh, okay, I get it. One of our bishops, Bishop Kevin Strickland, posted part of the letter that had been sent to him. Um, by a community member in one of the churches where he is bishop and said that he, this person, don't know their gender, but said that this particular person said their family was leaving a particular Lutheran church in their area because that the Senate was accepting of people who were two-spirit LGBTQA plus. And for this person that went against the Bible teaching. And so, again, if we are saved that we follow Jesus, then that means we are to follow Jesus. I also saw something very interesting. I wanted y'all to keep this in mind. Because I think a part of the back of my head already knew this, but until someone verbally said this, I was like, oh, yeah. Jesus said to follow me. Jesus never asked for us to worship him. Now, for a lot of people, that's shocking for a pastor to say, 
people will also run to the Hebrew scriptures and say, oh no, this is what it says. But think about it. Jesus said for us to follow him, not to worship him, and the only one we were actually told to worship, the creator himself. The reason why I want us to think about all this is because, again, we forget that Jesus modeled the behavior that we were to follow. Jesus did all that knowing at some point his life was going to take a different turn, his human existence, and he was human and divine, but his human existence was going to take a turn, so therefore he had to tell those who were with him, his disciples, his brethren, his siblings, his followers, the women, the women who were disciples, the women who were friends, the women, women who were in close relationship with him. The prevalence for us to continue to spread that, we had to spread love. And by spreading love, it wasn't just a sort of general type, but literally like being active. Love is an action term. That means you take an active participant. If you see a family member hurting, you want to help, right? So if you see a family member who's not related to you by blood, but literally because we're all connected by creator, because we're all human beings, we're supposed to do what? Help that person. As best as we can. Let, let's, let's remember that. As best. Um, as I like to tell people, I don't expect people to come marching with me down the street to the state capitol and demand things. I don't expect that. But what I do expect is people to care about one another. So in all of this, I was reminded, um, I had a conversation with Reverend Kenneth Wheeler, who wrote the book Up, The Resurrection of the American Church. And he sent me some questions that he had actually thought about a couple years ago, actually on, on the 4th of July in 2020. And he asked me to share them. And these questions are really centered toward, as he said, our white siblings. So one of the first questions that I placed out there on Saturday when I first did this was how would you define the racial problem in America? And the follow-up question is, what in your mind is the source of the problem? So that's our question today. What in your mind is the source of the problem? I want all of those of you who identify as European American, white American, etc., to really think about these two questions because they're really important. Because again, as people begin to sort of have, or have been for the past 10 years, freaking out about the low numbers, the decline in Christianity in America, and the fervor around it, and the trying to figure out what the problem is. And how I've seen churches, even the ELCA, again, freak out about certain things. Why are people leaving? Why are people abandoning them? And yet, very clearly, even in all that chaos, you're hearing Jesus say, come and follow me. Jesus walked among us teaching us how to care for one another. Jesus healed the sick. We cannot heal the sick. But there are ways in which there are things that we can do to help one another who go through sickness, whether it's physical, emotional, or mental. By that I mean illnesses, whether it's cancer or other things, someone suffering from COVID and just needs someone to care for them to bring them food and send them on the doorstep or someone who's going through a mental, emotional anguish. And we've seen the apex of that happen during the pandemic when I think all of us literally lost our natural mind. And we're still reeling with this today. People are still dealing with the trauma of this pandemic for literally hundreds of years. My people have dealt with the generational historical trauma of enslavement in the transatlantic slave trade. And we're still feeling the effects of that today. And this is why Kenneth Wheeler comes up with this question. How would you define it? And what is the source of the problem? I'd be very interested in hearing from folks. What do you think the source of the problem is? The other reason why I bring this up is because, again, we are seeing across the board, across the country, that people are trying to deny history, trying to ban textbooks and history books about the history of this country, that are trying to deny people 
access to education, employment, when clients are not seeking access to economic sustainability, not riches, not wealth, but literally just economic sustainability. They're denying people access to living a life authentically. But they do this all in the name of a Christian God that they proclaim that they follow. But I wonder if they're following God or if they're following the golden calf that they have made up to be God. A God that was trusted to do everything that they wanted to do instead of listening and following forward and following Jesus. And here is difficult to follow Jesus. When Jesus says that there are certain things you have to do, are you willing to let go of everything that's toxic, that's negative, that causes you to look at your neighbor and judge them on their appearance, their identity, can they love, or even how they work and connect with friends, or even for that matter, how they react as a human being when they go out and they talk about there needs to be economic justice, there needs to be food justice. There needs to be citizen justice, like all these things. Are you willing to follow Jesus or are you deciding that you love some God in the box? Because, spoiler alert, you can't. You cannot put God in the box, no matter how much. You can fashion God how you want to. And unfortunately, that has been happening across the country. And this is why we have systemic racism. This is why we have oppression. This is why we have white supremacy. This is where we have classism because people have fitted God in a box and said, oh no, God just wants this. And this is how I'm going to follow God. And I follow Ten Commandments. Well, spoiler alert, we're all human. We're all going to break relationships. We're not going to follow Ten Commandments like we should. Um, all those things. And we are not, there should not be a thing where we're perfect. So we are. We're human. We're going to do things. We're going to fail. We're going to get up and try again. We're going to Take the fact that we've done something to someone else. We're going to ask for forgiveness. We're going to ask God for forgiveness. And then guess what? Because God doesn't give up on us, we get to try again. We get to do things anew. That is the blessing of being connected to Creator. And that is the blessing of following Jesus. Because Jesus never rejected anybody, including Judas. Think about that. So I would love to hear from you. I don't want you to hear this as close to pausing. I think this is something we have to engage. Because we teach our children to be good to their friends and others and to be nice and to be fair. So if we're teaching our children to see another child as a human being, to share to be in relationship with, to play with equally, to love each other equally. If we're teaching our children that, why hasn't it stuck with us as an adult? And if we are the models that we hope our children look up to, what are we teaching them now? Remember, we're called to follow Jesus, to worship Jesus. Thanks be to God.
let us pray. Spirit of God, you're always among us, and yet at times we don't get, we don't notice or get caught up in our judgment. Not recognizing you in the stranger on the street or the stranger in me, who does not do the things I want, but rather the things I hate. Perhaps we thought our certainty would keep us safe or ignorance would keep us pain-free. But you show us a way of trust and awareness is what paves the path of peace. Forgive and help us, O God, by the power of grace and of humanity. Amen. So, as always, um, we are in this time of, of summer and we are enjoying everything. And this is also a time, I think, of of lots of gathering where there's always going to be lots of food. And we also are, it was funny because a lot of people, there was used to be the thing with Christmas in July that I remember growing up, people would talk about Christmas in July, and now they're like, it's six months till Halloween. You know, like Halloween now is a whole thing, because like, one thing I saw was replacing Valentine's Day with Halloween. I'm like, okay, great. That's fine. <laughs> but the whole point is that we're at this halfway point in the year. And all this time that you have to like catch up with folks. Um, I've definitely done that in going back to Chicago and seeing people I had not really physically seen in two years. Um, seeing our godchildren we had not seen in two years and they were able to celebrate with them and gathering around with food. And the reason why I think food is so important, which is why I'm so excited that we'll be doing dinner church this fall, is because that's what kind of people I'll eat with. It doesn't matter. You're opening up your, your home. You're opening up your fellowship hall. You're opening up your community center. And you're placing food out. And you're telling people to come and eat. You sit down. You get to know your neighbor or the person across from you. You have conversations. And you realize when you hear stories how connected we are and how much some of our upbringings have been similar and some of them have been different. But sometimes there's a sort of web, a thread, where we realize that we're all human. And it's usually around a table when you're eating and sometimes ideas come to light and things that you want to accomplish and some walls you want to knock down and some things that need to be addressed and ways in which you can see be better and you do it through food. That's why we love doing our mobile food pantry because we're able to, I'm able to have conversations, especially as my volunteer pool, my volunteer crew grows, I'm able to start having these meaningful conversations with folks. And they recognize me, they know me, and they tell me, and they ask me for prayer or whatever you or share a story or share a joy. That's what it's all about. Connecting around a meal means connecting to creation, which means connecting to creator. And we're able to fuel each other too. Sometimes food is for healing, like when you poop, when you're not feeling well. And sometimes food is in for celebration, because you're celebrating someone's life achievement or the little things. And sometimes food is there to comfort, especially someone who's sick or someone who's passed, and you're trying to sort of grieve together and come together as community and be there for one another. And sometimes food is empowerment. It is empowerment for us to continue to fight. That is what Jesus was trying to accomplish in that last Seder meal he had with his brethren, his disciples, his followers. Like all the folks that were gathered around him, because again, we can't think of just Jesus being just twelve dudes. Like people were following him. He had like he had no space himself, no no self care space, none of that, none, none, none of that. He was always crowded. Somebody was always around him. And for inter, and thank God Jesus wasn't an introvert, because I don't know what would happen. I am an introvert, and after a while, my social battery goes down. I don't want to talk to nobody. <laughs> so Jesus would have had to be an extrovert. But on that last night, when he was gathered with all these people. He knew he had to empower him because he knew what was coming. And so in that moment, he took bread, and we, everybody enjoys bread. Bread, whether it's, it was, I don't know if it was gluten-free, I have no idea, but let's just imagine. We have regular bread, we have all types of bread, we have gluten-free bread, and he breaks the bread, and he blesses it, and he starts to give it to everyone, and he says, take and eat. This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took wine. Now, I don't know what flavor wine was. It could have been red, it could have been white, it could have been sweet, it could have been Riesling. I don't know. <laughs> but he took that cup of wine and he blessed it. And he gave it to everyone gathered, said, here, drink this. 
This is my blood shed for you and shed for all of creation for the forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of our shortcomings, our failings. Drink it and remember it. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray in the words of our Lord's prayer.
Thank you for joining us for Wednesdays in the Wild, Midweek Wednesday Worship Service with Community of Good Neighbors Buffalo. On behalf of myself, Pastor Kwame, and my music director, Billy Brandown, thank you for being here. We hope that this has been a boon for you. We hope this helps you get over the hump of the rest of the week. God's peace, and we will see you right here next week. Take care.